What's up everyone? This is Peter Moller here. The name of the topic is called Taino, the Cultural Resurgence, a re-evaluation on Taino greeting terms. This is all part of an ongoing discussion on the topic of language revitalization. And in this video, we're going to lay out a lot of themes that I feel my in my opinion is going to be grounding. Now a few important themes that I want to lay out before we start this dialogue. I would like to begin with uh, for starters the Taino language of yesterday is no longer exists. And that is because all due to conquest and colonization. What we do have, what is left of it today, are toponyms or place names. Uh, we have examples of nouns, uh, names of objects, names of uh, fruits. Uh, we have names of principal ceremonies and gods. We also have names of important figures in the Caribbean. And we also have small examples of verbs that was used. Now, there are several problems when it comes to reconstructing the Taino language. And the main one is there is simply not enough to reconstruct in what was classified as the classic Taino language. There is simply not enough. Uh, what scholars say is that the Taino language is a poorly attested language and that is due to mainly the Spanish being poor ethnographers. Now, today we are going to review all of these things that concerns this topic. We're going to review both old and new terms, and I'm going to give my opinion here on what makes sense and what doesn't. Does it. Also, to keep in mind, uh, we are taking language uh, classes. Uh, from the Garifuna community. Now, the Garinagu, they are the community that has, that carries the language continuity. Why is that? The Garinagu who speak Garifuna carry the language continuity because they are the only surviving island Arawak language today. There are no more Kalinago speakers, and there are, and there are no more um, Taino speakers. The closest to understanding what was uh, the Taino language is by learning Garifuna. Now, we have also have Lakono, but Lakono is not Island Awa. They are more of a distant relative that broke off that the time that, that the ancestors of the Taino broke off from. So with all of this being said, we're gonna review all of these things today. And now let us get into the discussion and begin uh, this dialogue on reevaluating Taino greeting terms. Okay, now let us begin. Um, one more point that I want to add is um, within the Taino movement, you have various Taino organizations that have their own take in regards to um, reconstructing uh, a Taino language. And all, all of them give their own takes. Now, in this video, we're going to review all the good and the bad. 
And for starters, um, uh, these are some of the references that we're going to use for this presentation, which you see here on the screen. Uh, now we have more uh, citations, but they'll be mentioned uh, when they show up in the designated slides. So now we're gonna we're gonna start up and just get into the discussion here. The objective is to honor the Taino hierarchy within contemporary times. Now, some people may get offended with this, but the intentions uh, with speaking about this um, is to give a grounded outlook. Um, we as Taino descendants, and this is very important to note, we are not the Tainos of yesterday, but we are the ancestors of the Tainos. And we also have uh, other blood uh, within our ancestry. We have uh, African blood in us, and we also have uh, European blood. Now, with each individual, um, the percentages will vary depending on the individual's uh, genetic uh, makeup. Now, another thing to keep in mind is I'm not talking about identity. How an individual identifies, that's their own prerogative. Now, with this here, I'm just talking about uh, a general consensus. We are uh, we are a, a descended people who are trying to um, understand and to give uh, a better perspective on how those ancestors who we are descended from um, live. So uh, that's what I mean by that is to be able to um, apply these things within modern times. The basis of the discussion and topic, constructive dialogue on the classic Taino language. What we have are, are words that are very similar. We have a consensus being with Weiba. Garifuna probably would have Weibuka. From island to island in the region, they had different things occurring. The Kalinako's women's language make it close to the swag and style to what the classic Taino spoke. Garifuna has St. Vincent style Kalinago, and Kalinago in Dominica has the style of the Yeti women's language. Kalinago in Dominica was very identical to what documented as Garifuna and St. Vincent, but differentiated in their respective island soup. They are all a part of a common language family, meaning that they all ha had an Arawakan root. Uh, now, another thing that I want to review that's very important are the migrations and reviewing um, recent archaeological studies um, it has been refined. Uh, I've mentioned in, in previous video about Ban Wadi Man so now we're just going to briefly review this. So according to uh, scholars like uh, Basil A. Reed and also Samuel M. Wilson um, the history of the Caribbean, it starts with the Oderoi, okay? They were the first to enter uh, the Caribbean. Um, earlier studies would teach that the Casimiroi entered the Caribbean first. Now, um, 
recent archaeological study shows that this is in reverse. We know this because of the bones of Ban Wadi Man. Ban Wadi Man is the oldest bones in the Caribbean. So the history of the Caribbean starts with the Ordovoid of 5000 BC. Then 4000 BC, the Casimiroid. 500 BC, the Saladoid. 600 to 1000 AD, the Tyene and the Carib. In my opinion, this is where things really um, take shape until the event of the age of the arrival of the Europeans and the conquest and colonization itself. Now here, this is an important thing to review. Um, scholars say that the Tainos were a product of evolution, meaning uh, they evolved indigenously in the Caribbean. However, the ancestors of the Taino who gave, who brought the material culture, the religiosity, an element of material culture, the religiosity, but mainly the language, um, they came from the south, they migrated from the south. Um, so the Austenoid evolved into the Taino according to recent studies. Uh, before, before it was said that archaic groups did not have pottery. Now scholars are saying that um, do, and this is due to recent finds that um, the archaic peoples, which is, was mainly like marine hunters and gatherers, um, they also had, a, they practiced agriculture, but most of all they had pottery. Um, and before it was previously conceived that um, the earlier archaic groups um, did not have this. So now uh, new archaeological finds is revising um, the older uh, data when it comes to the people in the Caribbean. So now scholars are saying that um, the Caribbean, well mainly the Greater Antilles, that those people evolved indigenously. And that with the combination of the early groups that came in, uh, the people that came from the Yucatan and the earlier groups that came from the south, those ancestors <clears throat> uh, gave rise to what we understand as the Taino today. Um, now a few points that I want to make here, uh, one on the Yeti, uh, the, cap, the, the Spanish referred to uh, the Carina or the Kalinago men as Carib. So when you study uh, the French Chronicles, uh, you see that there was this conflict where the, the Karnago men or the Karina, the mainland Karina, um, they were killing the Arawak men and taking the wives. And from this we know that uh, this is where uh, the bilingual langu language of the men's speech and the women's speech uh, came from. So here I put that the island Karina replaced much of the Ayeti men of the Southern Caribbean after AD 1450. Um, Basil L. A. Reed, he says that the Karina men, they weren't successful in bringing about a full shift of language. Uh, Douglas Taylor and B.J. Hoff, they write that um, the Karina men, uh, they only leave a pigeon of their language. So uh, we can see from this that um, 
the Arawaks in the Caribbean, they were very strong and very influential. There was something about them that gave them a strong presence. And we can see this with the influence of language. So some other points to lay out with this. The island Carib men, as scholars sometimes call them, of the 15th century emphasized on warfare, including raiding villages to obtain additional wives. Now this goes back to the previous statement I made and we're going to further get into this in the next few slides. Swazian Tromasoid pottery is not island Carib, or it is not mainland Carina, as it is entirely a pre-colonial phenomenon that apparently disappeared after A.D. 1450. Now here scholars are talking about pottery. Uh, this, this is like crude pottery that's found in the Lesser Antilles. Uh, it's very simple. It's not uh, elaborated like the other pottery that we know that is derived from the Saladoid stock. Uh, and they say that after this, this time, um, this style of pottery uh, came to a complete halt. So I put this here um, just to use to explain about the absence of the Yeti men and the change that was taking place in the Lesser Antilles. How um, the Karina men were mixing with the Yeti women uh, to give rise to the bilingual speech that we understand today is Kalinago. Now we see this currently um, with the Kalinago as they are the custodians of the island Arawak speech. As you see here, that St. Vincent and the Grenadines, but mainly St. Vincent, was the land of origin of the Garinagu, the homeland of the Garifuna language. Now, this is where the Garifuna originally resided before they were exiled by the British to Honduras. Now today, with the uh, Garinago community, you have many Garifuna speakers. Uh, you have a lot of Garifuna, Garifuna speakers in Honduras and Belize, but they're also in abundance in the New York City area, such as the Bronx. So here, uh, once again, I just want to make mention about Ban Wadi. Now, according to archaeologists, this is where the beginning of Caribbean history begins, with the arrival of Ban Wadi men. And this is with the Ordoid migration. Okay, these are early archaic groups. Uh, Ban Wadi man is the oldest bones in the Caribbean. And we will get more into this shortly. Now let us move on. Essentially, the historical native groups of the Greater Antilles, which Caribbean archaeologists commonly refer to as Taino, did not migrate from South America, but evolved indigenously in the Caribbean, emerging around A.D. 1200 as a product of distinct types of ancestral societies and multiple historical processes. Okay, now this is cited by both L. Antonio Cruda and Basil A. Reed. Now this is found in 
Encyclopedia of Caribbean Archaeology. Uh, in my opinion, this book is better than the other one which is cited in the beginning, which is called the Oxford Handbook of Caribbean Archaeology. Um, now, when it comes to the migrations in that publications, um, the methodology that they cite is a little outdated. So, in the Encyclopedia of Caribbean Archaeology, that is a little more up to date. Now, to note, this means that the ancestors of the, Ta of the Tainos migrated from northern South America. Okay, uh, another example of this is uh, Julian Granberry as she makes the suggestion that the language of the Taino, um, you can trace it back to northern South America. The Taino of the Greater Antilles emerged on the island as a result of gradual evolution. Examples of pottery bearing archaic sites are La Luz, El Espiro, Catunda in Cuba, Guri 1 in Pascade 2 in Haiti, El Caimito in La, La Caleta site in the eastern side of the Dominican Republic, Playa Blanca and Hobo sites in Puerto Rico. It is now generally agreed that pottery making and incipient agriculture began in the Caribbean during the Archaic Age during the Archaic Age rather than the early Ceramic Age. Okay, now this is very important to review right now from Columbus's voyage. We're going to emphasize on his first voyage and his third voyage. Now let us begin. Columbus says, they all go naked as their mothers gave them birth and the women also, although I only saw one of the latter who was very young and all of those whom I saw were young men, no more than 30 years of age. They were very well built with very handsome bodies and very good faces. Their hair was almost as coarse as horses' tails and short, very important. And they wear it over their eyebrows, except a small quantity behind which they wear long and never cut. Another important point, some paint themselves blackish and they are of the color of the inhabitants of the canneries, neither black nor white, and some paint themselves white, some wet, red, some whatever color they find, and some paint their faces, some all their body, some only the eyes and some only the nose. And I was attentive and sought to learn where they had gold. And I saw that some of them wore a small piece suspended from a hole they had in their nose. And I was able to understand by signs that going to the south or going around the island to the south, there was a king who had large vessels of gold and who had a great deal of it. I tried to have them go there and afterwards saw that they were not interested. I determined to wait until the afternoon of the next day and I then leave for the southwest for according to what many of them showed me, they said that there was a land to the south and to the southwest and to the northwest and that these people from the northwest came to fight them another important point, many times and thus to go to the southwest in search of gold and precious stones. Last part. Now this part often gets misinterpreted. Remember the last two points that I just mentioned before this one here. <coughs> this is from the third voyage. The report of the Indians of this Española who said that there had come to Española 
from the South and Southeast, a black people who have the tops of their spears made of a metal which they called Wanin, of which he had sent samples to the sovereigns to have them assayed when it was found that of 32 parts, 18 were of gold, 6 of silver, 8 of copper. No, this is the earliest description of the use by the natives of the new world of alloyed metals. Now, all of this is cited from John Boyd Thatcher's book, Christopher Columbus, His Life, His Work, His Times. Okay. So, the first thing here... Um, this part where it says that black people, ugh, a lot of people misinterpret this for um, Africans arriving to the New World uh, before um, colonial contact. <clears throat> now, if you read, if you saw the first part here, where Columbus says. Um, in regards from his uh, first-hand um, eyewitness account of the first voyage, he says that the natives, their hair was almost as coarse as horses' tails. Okay, and to give a visual on this, um, this can correspond to uh, the appearance of the yellow mammo. Uh, also, we can use the appearance of the Lacono, the phonetic features that um, that they have. So this was around and about in how those ancestors appeared. Another point to make note of when they talk about uh, the people that came to fight them. Um, the Spanish would refer to these people as Caribs, who were none other than the Carinago men. So it was these people that were trading one in. Now, you see in the first voyage that Columbus was making reference to um, how the natives paint their body. Uh, one example is the, the black paint. So this last, this citation of a black people um, could be sim symbolic of that. Um, just the natives uh, wearing black paint. Because clearly in the first voyage, uh, Columbus gives a clear account of how the natives appeared. And we know that through DNA studies, um, the archaeologists um, doing the studies of the bones of the ancestors of the Caribbeans, such as the bones of the Lucayans, um, those ancestors through stu studies correspond to the Yano Mammo. So um, Columbus's eyewitness and first hand accounts corresponds um, to these studies that are coming out now. Now you see this picture of the child displayed here um, and look at the paint that he has and what Columbus was talking about was most likely this um, that the natives were painting themselves with black paint and this is what the Spaniards were, were seeing. Okay, now with the accounts that I just mentioned by Columbus, of uh, something from his first voyage and his third voyage, um, it's clear um, that the natives that Columbus described uh, closely correspond to people like the Yanomami or they also refer as the Yanomamo and also uh, in regards to the Wanin 
uh, the Wanin came from South America. Okay, here, according to Roguet and Rose, Wanin objects were traded into the Caribbean by caravan speaking island Carib traders, which were none other than the Kalinago. With objects ultimately derived from Central South America or Amazonian tribes familiar with metallurgy. The Caribbean groups were supposedly less sophisticated in their knowledge of metalworking. However, Caribbean Taino metallurgists have been credited with the creation of pre colonial works of art. This includes gold or probably hammered from alluvial gold dust, idols, or senes, mask, nose rings, and earrings. Uh, this is cited by Jeffrey P. Blick on the Wanin, and this is from Encyclopedia of Caribbean Archaeology. Important citations on this that I just spoke of is also Wild Majesty by Peter Hume and Neil L. Whitehead and The Black Carib Wars by Christopher Taylor. Okay, so let me repeat this one more time. This is very important from reviewing Columbus's log from the first voyage and also the third voyage. He's describing initially the people who he came in contact with. Now that passage from the third voyage that is cited by John Boyd Thatcher that often gets misinterpreted for Columbus um, seeing uh, an African people. Now, anyone that knows me personally, I am not biased, nor am I prejudiced to uh, fellow African Americans in the diaspora, but that citation is not referencing those people. It is referencing Arawak peoples uh, within the Antilles. What Columbus cite corresponds to the DNA studies for example, with the genome that was sequenced from the tooth from the Lucayan, which uh, the bones of from the Lucayan in the Bahamas is was compared to uh, that of the Yanomami or the Yanomamo. And look here where he says some paint themselves blackish and their hair was almost as coarse as horses. Now that reference to a black people once again a black people could be a reference to uh, can be a reference to body paint, body paint. A black people doesn't necessarily mean uh, of African descent. Okay. Now everybody that's has been following me and following my videos know that you know I never display any form of prejudice or biasness. So this is just being scholarly and citing scholarly uh, finds. Okay, and with all of this, this shows the relationship, uh, the back and forth riff between the Taino and the Carnago men who the Spanish often reference them as Carib. Okay, and from this when Columbus is talking about the gold and the one in um, we see from the uh, archaeological studies, the current archaeological studies, that we see that the Wanins were traded and distributed by the island Carib, the island Carib or the Kalinago. 
So these references for Columbus's diaries are uh, making reference to these people. And this is very important to understand because this will give us a clearer understanding and the conflict that was that the, that the Spaniards sided between the Taino and the Kalinago men. And the two sources that I mentioned, Wild Majesty and also uh, the Black Carib Wars, those are two good sources uh, to give you an understanding of these conflicts um, those ancestors had among themselves. Okay, now we're moving on. Comparing the relationship with the Taino and the Kalinago. We have Arike to see in Taino. We have Arika to see in Kalinago. So we see with Taino and Kalinago the close relationship. Arike and Arika. The difference is Arike recording by recorded by the Spanish and Arika recorded by the French. And the Garifuna they have Ariha to see. The Garifuna would say or use Nariha, I see. And in Raymond Brenton's grammar, Garaibe, we see Ariki, Arikiem, Arikiem, seeing. So, looking at all of these, we can see the close relationship that Kalinago has with Taino. The little bit that we have recorded from the Taino language, we can see the relationship with Kalinago, and we can also see the relationship with Garifuna. The only difference is when you look at Kalinago and Garifuna, there are some elements that Garifuna doesn't have that you will see in Kalinago and there are elements in Kalinago that we wouldn't see in Garifuna but that would be for a future discussion but just put it in, uh, out there now let's look at these terms um, when you look at these terms, uh, they're pretty much questionable. Some of them, we can get an idea of um, what was trying to be said, like with Bo Matum. Bo Matum was Koli Toste trying to make sense in how to use tiny words. Like take for instance Takahi, Takahi, uh, the time modern Tainos use this uh, to say hi or hello. Um, it comes, it's extracted from the 1665 Kalinagu, Kalinagu Dictionary, Tagaki, and it really means uh oh, okay in the 1665 dictionary. It doesn't mean hi or hello. And we can see uh, the connections with Karina, Wayana, and Akawayo with Takahi. Um, we have Takapure, 
takul tak takula takua takapure karina takua in Guayana and utakiri in Akawai. Okay, um, and, and these, in my opinion, has close phonetic similarities with Takahi, which looks Carib to me, looks Kar Karina to me, in my opinion. Next, we have Aneg Waba or Aneg Waha, and this is used for How Are You? Um, now, this is not a recorded Taino word, and so is Takahi. Takahi is not a recorded Taino word. These words are extracted from Kalinago, and we can see during the time of the early movement, um, the earlier pioneers were trying to understand how uh, the language works. So we can see Anekwaha or Anekwaba is the contraction of Aneke and Halekoba. We see Taiwei for good day. And we already know that uh, Tai meaning good has been debunked. So Taiwei wouldn't be make sense. Uh, to be used, okay, and a lot of people from the modern Taino community use Thai way, but recent studies reveals that the word Thai doesn't mean good, so that has to be revised. Uh, some Tainos use Tao or Yao. And that was also extracted from the Kalinago. It's not a recorded Taino word. And some Tainos also use it for hi and hello, along with takahi. And it was extracted from Rocha Fort's compilation of the Kalinago, and it means many thanks. Uh, Bomadun, I've already mentioned that, um, means big, generous, and the Tainos use that, some Tainos use it for thank you. The problem with this is it's not a documented word to mean thank you. The only island Arawak word that means thank you is ha-home or ha-home, directly taken from the Kalinago. Then we have the word Seneco. Seneco is not a recorded Italian word. Uh, it's mostly, most likely uh, extracted or inspired from the Ganifuna word Saragu, which means many, much, which could easily correspond to uh, the word Seneco. The problem with Seneco is it's very close to the recorded Italian word that we do have, Sanako, which means stupid, foolish. Um, here's one example with the language. Uh, when we say Watiaos, that's applying um, English grammar with the with the language. Watiao means our brother, our brother, our friend. And the language using the plural is the no. So saying our brothers would be Watiao no. Watiao no. Here we have examples of the pronominals. The only pronoun that's recorded in the Taino language is Daka and Dacha. So, um, using the Nakono for a top Arawak style, we came up with Dakia, Bukia, Likia, Tokia, Wakia, 
Hukia and Nakia. Okay, you see on the other side a comparison between Ta and New Arawak. Here you see an evolution of the pronominals. You can see from YU to Taino, the pronominals greatly differs from YU. You see Daka is very close to the Locono 1870. Dakia. Our Taino ancestors broke off from the YU uh, 2,500 years ago. YU is part of our lineage which broke off from the Salvadoid and Hueca migration. One more example, when we look at the word Tequeta, Tequeta is recorded by Peter Montier, which also corresponds with the Kalinago Toqueta and also the Garifuna Tuguta. The word Tequeta is recorded as meaning many, much, but that might be a discrepancy because the word toqueta and tukuta is like pointing that there. So there is an issue with that. And last but not le least, look what Las Casas says on the Spaniards' take in regards to the language. Okay, this is, comes from the apologetic history. The the business of no one's knowing the languages of this island, Kiskeya, was not because they were difficult to learn, but rather because in those days no man either of the church or laity took any care. Instead, they all merely made use of them, wherefore they had learned no more words in the language than give the bread, go to the mines, take out the gold, and such words were necessary for the service of the Spaniards in the execution of their desires. So this is a good example to explain why the Taino language was poorly recorded and it's because the Spaniards were only interested in learning commands, okay? And this is how uh, our Taino ancestors were exploited. Um, let's keep in mind, okay, this is initially first contact. So along with Columbus, the Spaniards coming into the Antilles, you know, the scenery was new to them. So those people, they weren't interested in uh, learning how the ancestors our Taino ancestors spoke. They were mainly interested in exploiting them to, to reap uh, their riches and resources, okay? Now, uh, looking into the next slide, um, this is not a primary source, but it is an important source because uh, what this source does, um, it compares many Arawak and also this includes Guarani and a little bit of mainland Karina with the Taino language and a little bit of Kalinago. What this source does, it cross-references are the Arawak languages in the mainland, the northern Arawak languages, okay, and these are the ones that are mostly related to Baniwa. And when you look at this source, um, you can see how much is related to the Taino. And when you look at um, the word list in this book, um, you're going to see how important that is because um, what this is going to do is to help um, make the connections with the Italian language. Now moving on next, okay? Now, 
when we are looking at what's recorded, okay, um, let's think about, again, first contact. When the Spaniards first came, when Columbus and, and all of that happened, right, Columbus established a fort in Quisqueya, which he renamed Española. Today, that's divided between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Okay, so all of these accounts concerning the religiosity and all that stuff mostly comes from there. Uh, we get bits and pieces from uh, Puerto Rico or Borinquen. But it's not that much because later on, um, not that much is recorded in regards to what I just said because um, of the hostility between the natives and the Spaniards. Uh, the natives in Borinquen, um, They were fed, already hearing what took place in Quisqueya, um, you know, there was, there was rebellions that was going on. And a good example of this is the re rebellion organized by Awebana, okay? There are two Awebanas in Borinquen. There's Awebana uh, Senior and then uh, there's Awebana the second, okay? And in my opinion, um, Borinquen uh, could be more closely related with the Kalinago. And as you see here, there's several reasons to suggest this. Uh, one of them being that uh, Borinquen was organ organized into a single Confederated Kingdom, uh, Granberry and Vasilius, they make a reference to this. Um, on the other hand, Quisqueya was more culturally diverse than Borinquen because in Quisqueya you had Upper and Lower Macorís, you had the Siguayo, and the Sibone. The Sibone was another Arawak stock in Quisqueya. Um, you had the classic Taino speakers who possibly spoke a uh, Ta Arawak dialect. But then we have examples of the word Ni Taino recorded by Columbus, Peter Martier, and also Las Casas who copies Columbus's diary. Um, Douglas Taylor, he also says that the Taino appears to have more lexical cognates with island carib which is island which is carnago than with uh locono so two scholars alfredo zayas and luis aquino they also make suggestions about uh Borinquen, uh being a yeti which we know is the women's speech of the Kalinago language. The reality of this is um, the Skiskean Tai as I said in the beginning, has no continuity. The language continually exists through Garifuna. Locono is not an Arawak. In Borinquen, the rebellion was much longer than in Quisqueya, which is why we don't get much accounts concerning religiosity and etc. because of the hostility, hostility towards the Spanish. The Caribs who raided in Borinquen, we know today are really the Kalinago men as the Spanish referred to them often as Caribs. The Gaif 
Funa or Garinagu is the only island, island, island Arawak spoken today. Other examples to suggest Kalinago connections in Borigen, one Awebana's name, the Watiao ceremony, which was first recorded in Borigen in 1509, and then a year after in Kiskea. The Watiao was first recorded with Awebana and Ponce de Leon in Wainia, second with Koto Banama and Juan de Izcaval in Hiwe. In the 1665 dictionary, we have the word recorded Mation, which literally means no ally, without friend, has no friend. So here we see the connections with Puerto Rico and Dominica, as well as with Kiskea uh, with the Watiao ceremony. We see, and this is another important part of uh, prefixing uh, the personal pronouns with uh, the words. Okay, one example is with the with the word anichi heart. We had we have two different first person pronouns. We have the D as the I my and the N as the I my. So if you're saying Danichi or Nainichi, you're saying my heart. We have the word Liani, which means his wife, the L being short for Li, he, him. So essentially we see that um, the Taino, the Kalinago, and also the Garifuna, they all have the Wat Diao. The Taino have Watiao, the same as the Kalinago, and the Garifuna has Watien. And this was mentioned by Rene Perez. The island Arawak connection, we have the word Nitaino. The Kalinago 6065 has Nitukai. The Garifuna or the Garinagu has Nidu Henu. The Locono in Guyana, they have Dayonobe. So we see the relationship here with close relations. We have the word Luku, like Locono. We have the word Lukiu. We have the word Lukayan. So here we see the close relationships with the language. And here we see a word list compiled by various Taino groups from documented Taino, Kalinago, and Lakono. And here are the Taino phrases and words that need revision. So it is a definite, if you're using Thai as good, I suggest in my humble opinion, you drop it because there is no correspondence that shows Thai meaning good. It validates that at the time when the Spanish arrived, they did not understand the language perfectly. A great example is Peter Martier de Aguilera. He was not a first hand witness to recording the Taino language. He was taking information from people who was coming back and forth from the Caribbean. And also, when you look at his decadas, 
the spellings he has for certain Taino words are off. In my opinion, Bartholomew de las Casas, um, even though he did not understood the language well, he has the standard spellings for the Taino language. Okay, so these words here, die, meaning good, okay, we know that has to do with blood and relations. Thy way as good day is no good because we know that there is no supporting evidence for Thai to mean good in the related Arawakan languages. Um, a lot of Tatayans use Thai Karia. Karia is a recorded word for moon. Comparing the Lakono, we know now that Karia literally means to appear. It doesn't mean moon. It means to appear. Tai Tirero for good night. Okay, I don't know where they get that word Tirero. It's not a recorded Tai word. It's most likely made up or it was an inspired word in an attempt to um, get a language uh, put together using uh, the recorded Taino words that uh, we have. Um, some Tainos use Tao Maudia for good morning. Uh, Maudia comes from uh, Ramon Bonnet's Relacion, which couldn't correspond with uh, Lacona words for morning. Uh, Daiku for good spirit, uh, Dao for hi, hello, Takahi uh, greetings, Bomadun, Enekuaba or Enekuaha for how are you, um, and the word Ada for people. Uh, comparing Arawak languages, there's no correspondence for Ada, Ada meaning people. Uh, com comparing, uh, we see that Ada either means tree, wood. Um, in Kainago, we have the word Arani, which means remedy or medicine. Okay, so with looking at these phrases, this is why comparing and cross-referencing is important because when you go into deep waters, um, you know, you start to see the connections and you know you're gonna see things that's gonna add up and then you're gonna see things that doesn't so when we look at the words recorded by the Spanish you know sometimes we can see that they get close to the actual definitions and then we see examples where the definitions are way off so this is why when we put words together, we have to be very careful in what we choose to use and apply. Okay, so uh, with Hiwayawa, with uh, mainly uh, Jerry Roman because he's the forerunner four guy uh, when it comes to um, uh, doing real work and putting the language together. Um, a great student that he has produced uh, which is uh, Maya, a uh, great student, uh, she has taken you know, uh, the research that we have all collectively done and she's applying it. She understands how the rules work and she has learned very, very, very fast. 
So here, uh, this is what we have developed for a new language uh, based on comparing and contrasting. And this here, I feel, is more grounded and realistic based on our collective scholarly uh, findings. Um, the basic phrases, and the basic phrases, this is the foundation. Without this, we won't be able to engage in conversations. Um, we, we have the word usa, meaning good, which we're going to explain about that in a sec. Um, we have usakasi, for good day. We can, you, you can use that as a general greeting, especially with somebody that uh, you don't know or haven't seen in a long time. You can use that as a general uh, good day. And you can start a dialogue with that. Usa alukali, good morning. Usa weyu, good afternoon. Weyu was one of our recorded words for sun. Uh, we also have the word kamui for sun. Usanonu, good night, good evening. A strong no without the pronominals, we're not going to get past the basic phrases. We have to learn how to use the personal pronouns, which we're going to get into in a sec. Here we see the correspondence for Usa. The Lakono use Usa for good. They also have Usahu. For goodness, the Garifuna has Usa for value, character. We also have the two rivers recorded in Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic, Usabon. In the Garifuna book by Luz F. Solis Ramos, uh, she has Lubuidun Usa, good ways. And Conrad Rigba, the linguist who deals with the Lakono, in a conversation, he told me that Usa is good and Usahu is goodness. Moving on, applying the personal pronouns. We have the Taino word Haba for basket. And we can see here examples how to apply the pronouns for top Arawak style and also a new Arawak style. Moving on. Now this is the more important part, cross-referencing words, because this is how we're going to be able to build a language by extracting the words that are the most consistent. An example for where you see a Garifuna has Halia and Halion, which corresponds with the Kalinago, Alia, and Halon in Lokono, to here, Okama in Taino, Aganba in Garifuna, and Ganam, Ganamba in, in Lokono. For I, we have Ako, Agu in Garifuna, Aku in Kalinago, Akoshi in the Lokono. Name, Edi, K, that, that's consistent with Kalinago, Garifuna, and Lokono. Fahan, Ukabu for Kalinago, Uhabu and Garifuna, Kabu and Lokono, Ahapu and Wayu. From uh, Garifuna, Kalinago, and Lokono all have Wadia. We see uh, the correspondence for in, for Garifuna, Kalinago, and Lokono. We have, um, these are the Taino affirmations and cultural expressions that make the most sense to me, in my opinion. Anahan Katu, Heketiwa, Luba Katu, Kiriti Katu, Aluka Anukaba Kakona, 
Kahia her wakia, we have a language. Usanonu da yukunu, good night, my people. Now, later on, we'll get into like applying more of the language based on the studies that we are currently doing. This is happening now at the National Museum of the American Indian, um, the Taino exhibit. If you haven't been checked out the Taino exhibit at Bowling Green, I highly recommend you check it out. Uh, not too long ago, they just had the symposium at the National Museum of the American Indian at Bowling Green. Okay, it was live stream while the Smithsonian Soon we'll have that out in subtitles via YouTube. And it's a great place uh, to go and learn uh, the contributions of the Taino resurgence movement. And it's also a great place to interact with other people in the Taino community that are active in this language endeavor. And it's also a good place to meet people and to uh, engage in conversation. It's open for a whole year until October of 2019. And hopefully it will be open longer. So I highly uh, encourage that uh, the people go and check it out. Uh, it's a great exhibit. This photo here is by Miguel Frankie, and this is a great example, in my opinion, of the Taino of the 21st century because it shows uh, the people in the Taino resurgence movement honoring the Taino hierarchy within the realm of contemporary times. As I said before, we are not the Taino of yesterday. However, we are the descendants of the Tainos who we are attempting to honor in not just uh, the language studies, but also in other areas through um, creating folklore, uh, music, um, educational documentaries, uh, programs like the program that was recently done at uh, Bowling Green. Um, also through trying to figure out, make, making sense of the time narratives and all that stuff and also through current comparative studies. Gaidi Roku Labanani Yukube Banwari, the first people in the islands are the Ban the Banwari people. Now uh, credit uh, to Maya uh, she's a great student with the language, and she's actually helped with uh, some of these uh, sentences. So shout out to Maya. Um, so this is very important. So now let's talk about uh, the Banwadi people. Um, if you see the earlier sl slide, uh, the revision that I put, okay, uh, the history as I said earlier, the history of the Caribbean, uh, it starts with the order word, okay? And we know this now um, because of uh, the bones of Banwadi man. Now, also important to know with Banwadi man, um, Basil A. Reed uh, makes a note there's a possibility that the bones which was found in Ben Wally Trace in Trinidad, 
may have been a woman. Now, these bones are the oldest bones in the West Indies or the Caribbean, and it's the oldest skeleton. Abakai Luku, the first island man. So, um, these bones represent the earliest inhabitants of the people who who lived in the Caribbean islands. As we see in, in the next slide, uh, these are the closest phenotypes to our Taino ancestors. This is how our Taino ancestors at a roundabout looked before European and African admixtures took place. As it says here, this is the closest round and about the Banwadi possibly looked like. Northern South American Arawaks. The Taino, however, had both archaic Central American and also South American Arawak admixture. So the Taino were a mixture of those two. As we know as the archaic peoples were the earlier community that inhabited uh, uh, the Antilles. And the Casimiroid were one of the earlier groups that came into the Antilles right after the Orderoid. The arrival of, ban, of the Banwadi Trace people marks the beginning of Caribbean history, according to Basil A. Reed. The oldest site in the Caribbean is Banwadi Trace in Trinidad, the burial site of Banwadi Man. Dated approximately 3400 BC, the Banwadi were the first to enter, enter the Caribbean followed by other archaic groups from Central America about 2,000 years after. By using a broad range of scientific techniques for studying human societies of the remote and recent past, using the surviving material remains of their cultures to reconstruct their histories. Western Amazon. Amazoid subtype, the most frequent type in the Western Amazon rainforest, common among Arawakan speakers who expanded into the Caribbean where it was the dominant type during the pre-colonial periods. So this is the round and about phenotype or the ancestors of the Tainos, of our ancestors, uh, appear before European and African admixture. The Lucayan genome was sequenced and was shown to be related to Northern Arawakan speakers. So this is about the tooth that I mentioned earlier from a, a Lucayan bone, right? This is the genome that they extracted from the tooth. Archaeological and linguistic studies shows strong Northern South Arawakan uh, connection. The present day Caribbean genomes demonstrate an element of continuity. So what does that mean? It means that the modern Caribbean descendants 
we have continuity. We are not the ancestors, the Taino ancestors of yesterday, but we carry their genetic legacy. Between pre-contact populations and the present day Latino populations. Milton Giti, who's our Garifuna teacher, he said, oh, when we start first started going to our, our Garifuna class, the Taino language, we have it. We have the Taino language. And it goes back to what I said. Uh, the Garinagu, they are the only island Arawak speakers today. Uh, it's interesting, uh, Julian Granberry, she says, we are fortunate that the descendants of the Yeti language, Garifuna, is still spoken today. Let me, let me read that again. We are fortunate that the, descendant, the descendants of the Yeti language, Garifuna, is still spoken today. Keep in mind with this citation, there is nobody today that speaks a full-fledged classic Taino language. What we have, as I said earlier in the discussion, are only fragments. Closing out, key points. Documentation of the Taino language is poor and scant. Cross-referencing is important in order to rebuild a language. Because of a lack of documentation on the Taino language, the language is going to be a new island Arawak language. So some things to suggest, the name of the language would be Ahiyahu Gaidi, island language, conversation with the descendants of the island inhabitants. Gaia Ahiyahu, island speech. So this just about wraps up um, this dialogue on reevaluating Taino greeting terms. Um, we reviewed some key stuff. All of this is to help us to keep a realistic perspective in our collective endeavors. I uh, gave examples in regards to the language and why it is important important to compare and cross-reference so that we the phrases that we create uh, based upon uh, what we have and what we extract we want to make sure that these themes all make sense and that they can be realistically applied now um, as I said in the beginning, um, each time of group, they're all going to have their own tape. Here, what I'm showing is an example in how um, we deal with um, comparing and cross-referencing. As we emphasize a lot in keeping it grounded because this is what we want to do. We want to keep it grounded. Um, we don't just want to just nitpick and just take stuff. Well, here, look, this is what we got. This is not what we're trying to do. Um, uh, people such as George Estevez, uh, also Renee Perez, uh, who, you know, put the awareness on Me Taino um, George Estevez composing the article Origins of the Word Taino, along with the insight of Kisa Joseph, uh, Jerry Roman, actively on the language scene, um, learning how the language works, um, getting input from various Lacono speakers uh, via Facebook and Messenger, uh, learning directly from the Garinago community. So, all of these input that we're taking um, that helps us to get insight and understanding as well as reviewing sources 
uh, to put a language together that makes sense. So with the slides shown here, uh, this is what we're trying uh, to encourage is uh, a grounded study so that way we can eventually uh, come up with something that we can all agree upon. So this is my discussion for today. I hope to observe this dialogue with an open mind and also use this to take the initiative to do your own studies. So this is Peter Muller here, and until the next bill. Taino D. Dareke Batibu. Aruka.